Greetings all. Welcome back to another session here for Tuesday Talk. Today we're going to be talking a little bit more about Levy and Stockwell's tech uh, book here called uh, Call Dimensions. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, sections in there about design and the importance of design. In fact, uh, today what we hope to be talking about is to look a little bit about learning tasks, how one incorporates uh, call design in a syllabus, in a course, uh, what are some of the call design related elements that are being built out there like uh, call tutors and the other call tools, intelligent call tools, and then to look at the different perspectives that are involved when considering, when trying to develop a, um, a call tool and uh, what we need to consider when we're thinking about designing something. Let's jump right in here and talk a little bit about uh, we as teachers. And when I say we, I'm obviously I'm referring to me. Um, I have learned from from uh, well since my early years in teaching that as a teacher, you, uh, as a teacher, you do not typically uh, rule the class by following whatever the textbook says, if you even have a textbook. Um, and I, I learned early on that the textbook is not the master, that I'm the master. In the majority of my technology courses, I do not have a textbook. Uh, I provide materials or I find materials that already exist online. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. One and two, it's very expensive. So I've learned very early on that as a teacher, it's going to be my job to be designing uh, materials and also designing call uh, based materials. It's even more so in the language realm when you're trying to design materials. Many teachers, in fact many theories and approaches to language teaching actually come from other fields of study like psychology, like first language teaching, uh, and they're brought to second language teaching in the hopes that they will be useful. They aren't always useful, sometimes they need to be modified. In other words, they take this idea, they take this approach, they take this uh, theoretical framework and it needs to be tweaked. They need to redesign it so that they can fit into our world. The same thing is going to be true with um, computer related uh, activities and materials. So if you look through the, the, uh, the available research that's out there, there's a big drumbeat for uh, teachers, called teachers, who are also uh, designated as uh, designers. It's just a foot that we have to, a shoe that we have to wear. And so we need to recognize that we're going to be out there developing things. Second point that I wanted to stress here is that when we're developing things, Actually, it, it just happens, and not that it, we, they try to do this uh, as far as teachers are concerned. But when they're developing things, you, you can't just use one approach. You're not just going to use uh, the communicative approach or uh, you know, the natural approach or whatever approach it is that you may consider. You, you're going to be mixing things together because you have to deal with a variety of different uh, components. And so it often, it's often the case that uh, not one approach is being used, but there are a number of approaches that are used based on the materials that are available, the needs and the abilities of the students and school. So there are a variety of, approach, of approaches that are being pulled together in order to, to use uh, and design call-related um, activities and tools. Um, now, all that said, that there are a lot of people who are involved in this business of designing uh, call-related activities. They are uh, experts in their field. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily, that I'm an expert in my field, but I have developed uh, materials. I've developed modules. I've developed software. Uh, I've run websites. Um, and so I have some training and some expertise in the technology end as well as in the linguistics and the teaching end. And again, I would always tell people you want to have a linguist techie. You as a, as a would-be uh, teacher in, in future for second language uh, teaching or, uh, or TESOL, you're going to want to have uh, that expertise. And there are many that are out there in the field, so you've got people who can help you out. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> Levy and Stockwell then go on and they want to talk a little bit about um, uh, computer-assisted language learning lends itself to task-based language uh, teaching. Um, and TLBT, task-based language teaching, is a relatively new um, uh, idea as far as teaching language. Uh, the focus then should not be on teaching uh, the language directly, but the focus should be on some task that a student needs to complete. 
And then in order to complete that task, there are there is a requirement of a language or vocabulary or some, some uh, skill that they need to uh, utilize in order to complete their task. But the focus is not language. The focus is on the task. Uh, and they describe what a, a call-related task should look like. And so now we're in having a, giving them a task to complete, but it's also a, a task that requires some form of technology. According to um, the writers here, they're saying that a, a, um, a task should have multiple solutions. It's not going to just be one answer. That, to me, is a big thing. Uh, right off the bat because for a lot of people who are teachers they use materials that only have one answer uh, open-ended or multiple option type of things are more difficult to grade and assess <clears throat> uh, as far as in, in an automated fashion and that's fine okay I'm, I'm agreeing with them that we want to have uh, activities tasks that have multiple solutions because it's going to allow for more creativity it's going to allow them to try to find a new way or a different way or some other way to complete a task it doesn't have to be just one way it's the way life is uh, it should be interesting to the user um, now this this one element in my opinion is the most important thing for language learners I have seen language learners who have a passion for learning, even though they don't have the aptitude uh, of other students. But because they had a strong desire, they succeeded. There have been other students that I've met who are very good with language, but were not motivated, and they did not succeed. So when you're creating a call-related or any type of uh, task for your students, it should be interesting. They should have a passion for it. They should be able to want to do it. Tasks should be collaborative in nature. I don't know that I'd necessarily agree that it has to be collaborative in nature, but certainly it's more interesting when you learn in groups. And for the most part, we as a people tend to learn in groups. What I don't like about collaborative in nature is then people are required to work with other people who may not be as interested as you are. I don't like that forced group type of thing. But collaborative work, generally speaking, is more interesting for the individuals. Uh, a a call-related task should use some form of multimedia. Uh, it should use um, a video like this or audio or uh, even a tutorial where you've got animation uh, of some sort going on. It should use multiple senses and multiple skills. So we're not just going to do reading or listening or uh, we're, we're going to have to do some writing that's involved. We're going to have to try to create things. Uh, right now, you as a listener, as a viewer of this, are using only two senses. You're using your sight and you're using reading. Those are the two things that you're using. Now, if we were to be able to do this live and I could ask you questions, or if I were to put questions in here and at some point you'd have to stop and you'd have to respond, now that's going to be writing. That's going to be a little more active, uh, interactive uh, reaction here. That would be better. The more senses that you can use, um, the better. That's simply the way language is, though, isn't it? I mean, there are so many times where you have multiple things going on and you have to be able to process. Obviously, young learners don't want this. They want to have more limitations so that they can get around and do things. But, you know, world the world comes at you in many different facets and forms. And so being able to handle and, uh, and deal with multiple senses and multiple skills is going to be a very positive thing for us for a language learning should also present a challenge, something that they're going to try to achieve. They have to have, um, <laughs> they have to have a quest, something that they're going to try to achieve. Um, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's definitely more motivating when you have a quest uh, that you're trying to achieve. All right. Uh, tasks should also be uh, authentic. And when uh, they talk about authentic here, it's supposed to be a real thing, something that actually they would encounter in the target culture if they were going to be there, right? So um, anywhere in the literature that you read with regard to creating materials, be they call-related or not call-related, authenticity is uh, very high on the list as well. So, And I would definitely agree uh, with uh, these guys here, uh, Levy and Stockwell, and the uh, multiple uh, authors that they, that they quote. 
Uh, it should be goal-oriented. It should be output-oriented. In other words, uh, what they're creating is something, some type of a product, be it a writing, be it a speech, be it a uh, some type of conclusion that they finalize or formalize. Uh, it might even be a resume. It might be uh, you know, a speech that they have to write. But it's going to be some type of goal that they're going to have, some, some product at the end. Uh, now, obviously, when they're doing the product, the whole process is important. But the end game should eventually be that product, right? Uh, this is another one that I would hope to have, um, interaction. It should include real and natural interaction. Um, uh, the best type of interaction would obviously be with native speakers, although that doesn't necessarily have to be. But it should be real. It shouldn't be pre-programmed. It shouldn't be... Uh, um, you know, stimulus response type of uh, answers. It should be a real interaction that they're trying to, uh, that they're using in order to try to complete this particular task. Uh, the task that you're doing should activate background knowledge. Again, you need to know what that background knowledge is, but you should make them go back there and use and process that information that isn't necessarily part of the original task that they have, but they've got to go back and get more information. It should also encourage learner autonomy. And as I said before about being authentic and being motivated, learner autonomy is huge because most language learners learn by, uh, learn by themselves. And I mean without the aid of a teacher necessarily. The ones that are motivated, the ones that uh, are, get, the, get the desire to want to learn are those that can do it by themselves. Um, so I try to encourage autonomy as quickly as possible. I try to give students the ability to ask questions, to analyze, to assess language early on in the process so that they don't need me. Not because I don't want to be there, but because I want them to become autonomous learners. That way they're more independent and they have more uh, confidence in the work that they're doing. All this can be put together in uh, uh, what one of the authors here calls uh, interactionist theory. You're interacting with one another, you're interacting with the materials, uh, and that's a way that you're going to see noticing and negotiating, and those are two big things in uh, second language acquisition. And so throughout all this, they're going to in increase their language ability. And so we want to try to design, and that's the key that we're talking about here, we want to try to design activities that incorporate these ideas, right? these ideas of learner autonomy and, and uh, goal outputs and uh, being authentic and so forth. Um, that's the kind of task that we want to create. Now, I'm trying to design activities, but now the question is, how do I incorporate this into my classroom? Um, now, there are some times where you're freer, you, you're, you're more free to incorporate materials that you have into your classrooms. There are other times where your hands are tied. Uh, the university or the college or the school or whatever has given you a very limited uh, framework from which you can uh, you can do your work, and if you can't deviate from it, then you're 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 stuck within that system. Um, other people have the choice, but they simply prefer to live mostly in the non-tech world as opposed to living in the tech world. And maybe because of the students' abilities or interests uh, in in technology. Uh, I would think that the best thing to do is to use the best of both worlds and to set up hybrid systems. Now, I typically set up a hybrid class in any of the courses that I teach because there are certain things that don't require a teacher. Uh, having them be involved in a discussion, especially at the at the lower intermediate, intermediate and advanced levels, uh, if they don't need me, then I want to push that off into an area that they can do by themselves. Okay, again, you want to make them independent learners. You push that off to something that they can do by themselves, so that I can focus on things that require me, uh, require a teacher in the classroom. So I like hybrid systems. Uh, some of the things you can do face-to-face, -face, some of the things you can do online. That's a better way of setting up things, at least that's what I believe. So we want to incorporate the design of our call activities, of our call tasks, and we want to do it in such a way so that we don't uh, screw up the existing uh, curriculum if one already exists, uh, but also at the same time take advantage of the tools that exist. So we take advantage of those tools by designing and tasks that meet the needs and aspirations of the students, as we've said before. All right. Some of the researchers here 
had discussed whether they want to do call activities that focus on second language learning, the whole thing. <clears throat> Others talked about only focusing on one area, only focusing on reading, or only focusing on writing. And so that's going to be an issue when you begin to consider designing a task. Do you do skill-specific? Or do, or do you do database specific, or do you do bigger? Do you do SLA related uh, types of tasks? So you can do skill specific. You can do only reading. You can do only writing. Uh, you could do pronunciation, just pronunciation skills using uh, using call. Or you could use database specific. When I say database specific, I'm thinking of vocabulary and grammar. Grammar. Both of these are a set of rules and a set of uh, vocabulary. <clears throat> um, for using uh, the rules, and of course, uh, the lexicon is just a, is a whole bunch of uh, words. But I may focus use a call related uh, activity to focus on one of those databases, or it might be the whole area of second language acquisition altogether. I can create and or use a skill, design a skill, design a, a task that does the whole thing. There are a variety of levels. <clears throat> Some of the other tools that are out there are things like a call tutor. Um, I don't really like the name that's being used here, although I do understand what they mean by it. A call tutor, computer-assisted language learning tutors, are automated responders to uh, input that students put uh, down. Um, years ago, there was a psychology uh, tutor, I guess you could use as the word, and uh, it was programmed to answer uh, questions with non-specific answers, right? Uh, so you would say, you know, I'm tired, and then the computer would simply shoot back an answer that would be something like, oh, you know, why do you say that, or why is that? And then you could literally have this conversation with the program. It had no idea what you were saying. It was merely an algorithm to try to get them, to get, try to get the reader, the user, to think it was something. Uh, but that was kind of like uh, a tutorial type of thing, where you have this automated responding. Now we use automated responding in, in uh, call when you, for example, you create a quiz or a practice activity, and if the student gets it wrong, you know, you put up a little message there that says, "Oh, nice try," but you know, you got to look at this here. Try again, and you let them to try again. And if they get it right, you know, you put some praise there. Hey, good job! And and so when you're setting up a, a call-related task, you could put in information like that. More sophisticated systems actually do try to assess and analyze what it is that the students are doing. There are evaluation programs for writing, for example, where a student will actually submit a writing and the, the uh, writing evaluation program literally looks for topic sentences, uh, logical connectors, uh, length of sentence, complexity of sentence. And so it's rather, it's rather interesting. It can provide some information to the students, and that would, that's what they would call a tutor. It's some type of automated analysis. Um, and that's what uh, an ILTS is. It's an intelligent language tutor system, intelligent learning uh, tutorial system, tutor system. There's also intelligent call. <clears throat> Uh, these are, are similar types of systems. There's also natural language processing. Natural language processing is at the higher end of uh, computational linguistics uh, where they're using uh, the, the strength and power of computers to try to analyze language to provide some sort of response and also to glean some sort of understanding about student and learner abilities. Uh, a tutor assistant is, again, basically like a, a call tutor. When we get down here to electronic tandem resources, uh, I'll be honest, uh, until I've read this book, I never heard of it. Um, I don't know if that means it's not popular or not, um, but when I read it, I was like, oh, this sounds, sounds a little bit interesting. It's basically where you're dealing with two people who are both language learners, learning different languages, and they're working together, like for example, in email or on a document, and they're working together using both of their languages to try to help each other out. And it is an interesting <clears throat> uh, idea out there, and obviously people do this all the time, where they get pen pals or they get uh, email pals, and they can write back and forth to one another. This is what this idea of electronic tandem resources are. Note, and I don't believe this is in the text, Call, computer assisted language learning, is becoming more complex. There are more tools, there is more hardware, which means that it's going to require 
language teachers, language uh, call designers and users, it's going to require that they have more expertise in understanding and using the tools that are out there. So you need to recognize the dynamic nature of the things that are happening, of the hardware that's out there, of the new software that's coming in, of the users and how they're coming in. Now, it may be in the in the place that you uh, that you teach or that you uh, work on designing. So y your students may have very little computer ability, so you're going to have to gear down. Obviously, the dynamic is going to change. You may work in a place where, you know, I remember when I at one point when I was working in Japan, I had the opportunity to go work at a computer university. You know, that's all they did. Everybody, every student there was involved somehow with uh, computer technology. Well, I mean, developing call materials for them would have been a piece of cake. Uh, they would have been felt right at home there. I've been to other places where the colleges and schools barely even had enough technology for uh, a classroom. Uh, so it's going to depend on the users that are involved there. Again, it's going to depend on the hardware, the software. I'm amazed that in places like... Um, uh, Zaire, uh, places like in Central Africa where not many people have have computers, not, uh, relatively speaking, to here, but everybody's got a cell phone. And so, okay, now how am I going to use the cell phone? How am I going to design materials uh, so that the cell phone can be used? So just a note, it's becoming more complex. There are many more avenues that we can access and interact and design materials for our users, pro, you know, provided that all, the, all of the requirements are met. And so we just want to be careful that while we're thinking and uh, considering designing. Um, different perspectives. Different perspectives of the design depending on the teacher, the student, or the institution. Uh, now, um, Schinderman, I think that's his name, he was right when he said uh, um, that this is a process. Developing materials is a process, similar to writing a paper, that it's a process. Obviously, it's also a product, and eventually we will have a product that we will put out so that people can use, but it is a process. Um, also, uh, Schneiderman also says that it's non-hierarchical. There's not a specific order that needs to be done. There's not a, a you know, an overarching, not necessarily, okay? There are sometimes where all these different modules and there's really no way to hook them together in any hierarchical form. Um, developing materials is a radically transformational process. Because what we're doing when we're trying to design call materials is many times we're taking things that were static, things that were uh, paper-based, or things that were, uh, you, you know, overhead-based, and we're trying to make them dynamic. And so it is a tremendous change from what had been done in the past. Um, so when we're designing these things, we need to recognize it's a big change. It's a big transformation from what we had to what we're going to. Uh, I, I'll give you a, just an example. I know that uh, 10, 15 years ago, everybody was using cassette tapes. Do you remember those cassette tapes? You may be in a place where they still use them. Well, today, I, I don't even know where I could buy a cassette tape, let alone uh, go. I wouldn't go out and purchase a CD anymore. Why? Because more and more things are being put on, um, uh, uh, put it being set up as an MP3, and you put it on a mobile device, or you simply have it on the internet. I have a whole bunch of listening activities that I don't have in paper form. I don't have on a cassette. Everything is online, so if you want to get to it, you have to get to it there. It's changed the dynamic of of uh, of language learning, and it's a different process. It's a different process. Finally, uh, the designs that we do we should make should be uh, involve some form of discovery. It should involve some form of of a discovery of new goals. <clears throat> Being involved in the development, this is what he means, being involved in, the, involved in the development of materials inherently means that as you create and as you try to use call to move into new areas, what happens is uh, you start doing research in a new area. You start finding a new goal because you're moving out into a new area with regard to 
uh, with regard to language learning using the technology. Um, this textbook is a clear example of this because there are lots of new studies and new researches going on relating to the use of computers and language learning and language teaching. Oh, these are new goals. They didn't exist before. And so that's going to happen as we move along in the process. But when we do design, we need to remember there are different perspectives. It's actually, it's the same uh, regardless of what tools you have. Uh, I remember years ago uh, seeing this, it was this big uh, uh, cartoon uh, describing all of the ways that uh, a product was envisioned. There were the designers, there were, uh, there were the developers, there were the drafters, there were the you know, you know, the implementers, there was the customer, and each picture was different. <laughs> You know, the perspective that you have is going to be different. Uh, and so we as teachers have one perspective. We as designers should have one, but we should always be thinking, what does the student want? What does the university want? We want to have, you know, horizontal and vertical type of, uh, of connections. We should be remembering the, these things. All right, how to in, uh, from a teacher's perspective, how to integrate call into the curriculum. You know, that's going to be something I'm going to have to deal with. I've got this curriculum. How do I integrate it? Is my curricula flexible? If it is, yay, I can mold and shape and put something in. If it isn't, I'm going to have less flexibility to try to incorporate certain technologies. I may not be able to use ones that I like because the curriculum is too inflexible. <clears throat> I need to find out what that is. Now, me as a teacher, I want as much flexibility as I can. I don't like it when the institution starts to tell me what technologies I must use or must not use. When the institution begins to tell me, for example, what materials I can use or not use, right? Uh, obviously, you wouldn't like that either. You want that flexibility. Now, there are some people who like the fact that the institution is limiting them. That way, they don't have to think. They don't have to think as much. They don't have to be as creative because they're going to follow that path. My recommendation would be that we had a, have a middle road where I have some flexibility and yet some structure. Um, and that's the way I would see it to be. I, me as a, as an administrator, I want to try to give that flexibility to my to my teachers to have them go out and do things. But at the same time, if they need structure, I want to make that uh, give them that as well. <clears throat> I want to give uh, my students, if I'm developing things, I want to give them the ability to be in the, become independent learners. That's something that I want to stress when I'm developing. Okay. I also want to have the freedom to develop. Okay, now, now that's going vertical now, but horizontally, I want, I want to have independent learners. I want my whatever I'm making, allowing my students to go do it themselves, so they don't need me. Right, give them that freedom, that ability, that confidence. <clears throat> From a language learner perspective, now, uh, they want it to be easy, right? Keep it simple, <clears throat> and I cannot agree more. If something is easier to deal with, easier to work with, it's going to be picked up faster. Uh, today, PowerPoint is a piece of cake, a presentation or Impress or, or whatever software you use to develop a presentation. It's very, they're very simple to use. <clears throat> a very nice, a very attractive uh, program to use is something called Prezi, which we will look at later on in the semester. But it's harder to use. And I believe one reason why it's not as popular as I think it should be, because it is a, it is a cool tool, because it's more difficult to use. So make it easy. Making it easy makes it popular, right? Include a familiar look and feel, okay? When you're developing materials, when you're developing and designing a, a call-related task or a tool itself, uh, try to find that uh, similar <clears throat> Uh, familiar look and feel so that students can become more acclimated to it faster, right? Uh, if you need to do some training, you should employ that training. Now, in my opinion, in nearly all of the tools that uh, that are being made now, your students aren't going to know. They're going to need to be trained in uh, learning how to do that, just as like they're going to need to learn how to use flashcards properly. Uh, whether you use uh, paper flashcards or digital flashcards, uh, they they're going to need to learn that. And so I, I you're going to need to learn how to uh, uh, respond to a paper. You know how to give a proper response, how to give proper feedback, uh, how to look for certain things in an academic paper. I and mean, they're going to have to learn how to do that. So you're, you're going to have that training. And so training should begin early, so that again they can become independent learners. They can do that themselves. 
and they're going to want to try to have horizontal integration, which is what I was already talking about, uh, so that students can help students, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, Khan Academy recently came out. I think it was last year they came out with an article talking about how uh, they could find, they could see in one math classroom that there were 20 students and they were all at varying levels of success uh, throughout the program and they would assign more advanced students to go down and work with less advanced students within the classroom, right? They were working with each other. Um, that sort of horizontal integration. If you have that ability, that's a great thing where you can have people at that level helping each other. Again, that's also promoting independent learning because they're not requiring the teacher to do it. They're working with one another. Uh, horizontal integration. From the institutional perspective, they are not concerned about this. They're all concerned about horizontal integration. How do we hook in my class to the uh, call the school class, to the university class, to the to the whole system that's part of the the uh, the uh, school that you're in. <clears throat> now, the institutional perspective is far less concerned about individual achievement. Is they're more concerned about unity, cohesiveness, having information transferable. Um, so they're the ones that tend to want to lock things down in more of a systematic approach because they need to. I mean, they've got to be able to collect monies and, and collect grades and collect homework. They're the ones that have to analyze things. So I'm not bashing uh, the university at all, but because of their desire to want to have things uh, collected in a more in a more systematic approach, they are more concerned about uh, limiting how things are done. So the, the vertical integration tends to... Uh, restrict the the variables that teachers may have. Their main concerns are cost, right? Centralization and technical consolidation. They want to centralize things because they're collecting all this data. Cost is another thing, uh, which behooves me. I don't understand why universities and schools do not use something like Moodle because it's open source. <clears throat> Bear in mind, there is a lot of research out there that says that open source products, although they are good, the switch over can be expensive and uh, the need for technical support may also be an issue. Um, where else are we here? So, so they have fewer options for designers. They take away the options that we may want to have, okay? Universities tend to be more interested in course content management systems like Blackboard or the system that I often use, which is um, Moodle. They're more interested in those. They're easier to control. However, they also have fewer options for call designers. Now, I say that there are fewer options for call designers unless you can create your own modules in an open source system. Again, as I go look at, at uh, a Moodle type system, they have hundreds, nay, thousands of applications, thousands of modules that you can plug into the uh, course content management system, Moodle, because it's open source. All these people who are there, people like me, who say, hey, I need this module, and they make it. They install it into the system, and it works. If you work with a course content management system that is proprietary and they have fewer developers, that's going to be more difficult. Uh, and you're going to have fewer options for the designers, okay? Not always the case, but you see these three different perspectives. You've got the teacher's perspective, who's involved in teaching and developing independent learning and all the other goals that we saw and, uh, re you know, expectations in a, in a call-related task. You've got a student's perspective that it should be fun and interesting and... Uh, um, and then you have the university's perspective, right? You got three different perspectives. All right, let's uh, let's recap here as we finish up. Uh, we want to keep the learner in focus when when we're developing a call activity. And when we're going to sit down and say, "I'm going to design some some activity," we should always be thinking about what does the learner need. What will the learner enjoy? Will this be too difficult? Will it be too boring? Find out. That's what you're going to, have to keep your focus on. Remember their user needs, their expectations, their limitations when designing uh, call-related material. Now, note here, just me now talking. My experience up until now has been that many language learners have low expectations. So I tend to want to raise the bar and convince them that they can do more. Usually, my students rise to the occasion and do more, and they're excited about learning. 
On a few occasions, I've had students who failed, and that's not been a good thing. But for the most part, I think their expectations are low, so I want to raise the bar. Two, be sensitive to a learner's characteristics, their learning context. Okay, I want to be sensitive to where they are, their concerns, their fears. Okay, and they may have a fear, and I want to help them overcome that fear. But I also want to be desensitive to the way that they learn. Okay, maybe they're less analytical and they're more emotional. Well, I've got to find some way to to make that fit in a tech world. Um, quote here from Patton. Uh, out of the movie Patton, where Patton, General Patton was talking about uh, his German counterpart, and he said, I read your book. I read your book, and therefore I knew how you were going to fight. In the same way, we as teachers should know our students so that we could better plan and develop and design effective call-related materials. <clears throat> you, as a language developer also, you need to know your learning environment. What do I have that's available to me to use? What do I have that I can give to my students, right? I need to know my audience. I need to know the administration. What are they willing to allow me to do, right? Will they give me the freedom to do things or won't they? I mean, I need to understand who that is before I start developing, right? I need to refine and do it incrementally. Uh, what you have is good, you can make it better. Yeah, that was a phrase that a, a professor of mine used to say to me. What you have is good, you can make it better. Okay, and you continual, continually go through the product development cycle as you make things better and better. And you can do that, right? Last, uh, lastly, uh, try to link your, your ideas to theories. Uh, link them to research that's already out there. Again, one of the reasons why this is such a good book is because he links, or they link all of what they're saying to to some type of empirical data. So link it to theory, test it, test it again. Make sure, make assurance double sure, as uh, Shakespeare would say in Macbeth. And lastly, be creative. One of the things I love about technology is that there are so many different things that you can do with it, so many different ways that you can be creative with it. So please, as you're considering designing materials, designing call-related activities or tools, be creative. Think outside the box. All right, well, that's all for this uh, Tuesday talk. I hope you did enjoy it. If you have questions, you can certainly give me an email. Talk to you later.